Well, we finally come to the last era of the Phanerozoic Eon. It's the Cenozoic. And the first period of the Cenozoic era is the Paleogene. This occupies the time that used to be known as the early tertiary. It is a continuation of many things, but it is also a time of vast change and continuation of the mountain building events of the Laramide orogeny, for instance, in Western North America, still producing compressional structures like this, the Rapley monocline in southeastern Utah, right along the San Juan River there, beautiful layers that have been warped into a monocline fold. The climate would continue to be warm throughout most of the Paleogene, but then see some major changes at the end. Life would see major changes right at the beginning, with the fifth and final of the big five mass extinctions to begin the Paleogene period. Gone are many creatures that once dominated the planet, both on land, in the air, and in the sea. And so now we see a new beginning, and Bacillosaurus here, represents one of those beginnings. That looks like a Mosasaur from the seas of the Cretaceous, but it's not. It's actually a mammal. So we'll talk about whales and their evolution, as well as other creatures. And the Paleogene is a time of intensive diversification of mammals and other animals. Let's first talk about the Cenozoic era. It picks up after the Mesozoic at 66 million, all the way to the present. So it is 66 million years in length, and it is the youngest of the three Phanerozoic eons, the Paleo, Meso, and now Cenozoic. So there's a lot of detail there. We've split the Cenozoic into three periods. That's the current convention, the Paleogene, Neogene, and Quaternary. So those are the three periods of the Cenozoic era. Still in common usage, though, are older terminology like tertiary and quaternary. The Cenozoic used to be divided into two periods, a longer tertiary period and a shorter quaternary period. The quaternary has remained the same, but the tertiary has been replaced by neogene and paleogene. On many maps and articles, you'll see the word tertiary, and it's simply the older term for the earlier part of the Cenozoic. The Paleogene now is early tertiary, and late tertiary is the Neogene. These terms, quaternary and tertiary, are from back at the beginning when geologists were looking at rocks and deciding their age, and without the benefit of isotope dating, they were just going on relative positions. And so, they called the oldest rocks primary and then secondary. Tertiary is a third level and quaternary would be the fourth and youngest. So this whole era is 66 million years in length and some perspective in terms of Earth's history, that represents less than 2% of the entire geologic timeline, starting from 4540 all the way around the wheel that is the last 1.5% of Earth's history. The Paleogene period spans a range in age from 66 million to 23 million. And it is the oldest of the three Cenozoic periods. You can see from the ICS time chart, it's the end of the Phanerozoic Eon. Here's the Cenozoic era. Here are the three periods. So it's the first one. Now we can start talking about some of these smaller time periods, including these epochs, okay? And so, Eon, Era, Period, Epoch. And the Paleogene has three, the Paleocene, the Eocene, and the Oligocene. You know it's a epoch if it ends in Scene. So, Paleocene means the older part of the Eocene. That's how they came up with that word. Seen meaning new, and Eo here means dawn. So new dawn, we'll talk about Oligocene in a little bit. Sometimes this whole 
Paleogene period is referred to as the early tertiary, which used to span the time from 66 million all the way to the quaternary. So the first half of that or so, some people call it early tertiary, and that would be what the Paleogene more or less is. Some people actually split the tertiary into three parts, an early, middle, and late. The early tertiary, middle tertiary, and late tertiary. Geography of the Paleogene is continuation of the Cretaceous, where we left off. Now all the continents of modern-day Earth are taking shape. They're all separated, some more than others. The North Atlantic Ocean Basin, the South Atlantic, is continuing to widen. It's more of a seaway, probably. We have the Pacific out there, of course. Antarctica, situated at the South Pole, and that hasn't changed. Australia is hanging out very close to Antarctica. It hasn't rifted away much. There's a very narrow seaway there. India has made some progress moving north towards Eurasia. So that collision right there will form the major modern-day mountain range on Earth, the Himalaya. It's a time of the continents getting into their present positions, but also it's a time of mountain building. And some of these major mountain belts, including the Himalaya over here, the India-Eurasia collision, the Africa-Eurasia collision forming the Alps, of course the Rocky Mountains continuing over here in North America, and the Andes in South America. Some pretty cool landscapes in these mountain belts. The Himalaya, of course, has Mount Everest, the highest point on the planet right there, 29,028 feet. Okay, and this is looking at it from the Chinese side, and it's what's called the North Face. And there's different routes up there. The routes they take seemingly go right up the side, like with the Eiger. It looks like you could just hike up like to the top there or right up here. And some people have gone right up the, the sheer face. So whether it's the Eiger or whether it's Everest, these are major mountain peaks in a much larger mountain belt. The global paleogeography of the Paleogene period, using Ron Blakey's Global Reconstructions, these show the situation at the beginning of the Paleogene, 66 million right at the KT boundary. So North America is taking shape, still separated from South America, Gulf of Mexico, of course, still have connection of the Pacific and North Atlantic. South Atlantic, more of a seaway. We're seeing the first signs of rifting between North America and Eurasia the formation of the Arctic Ocean Basin. In the Eastern Hemisphere, we're seeing Africa moving farther north, pinching the Tethys Ocean. Here it's more of a seaway, and this collision between this continental block and Western Eurasia is forming the Alps. So a large mountain range here starts to form. And a little farther east, we see the subduction of the Tethys is bringing India closer to Eurasia. Moving a little forward to the Eocene, 50 million. You can see the separation of North America with Eurasia, both the western part and the eastern part of Eurasia there, is taking place, the Arctic Ocean Basin developing. So the North Atlantic and Arctic are forming at this time. Collision of Africa with western Eurasia continues forming a nice robust mountain belt known as the Alps. And finally, collision of India with Southeast Asia. And this initial collision is forming the Himalaya. So not since the Alleghenian highlands of the Pangaea supercontinent have we seen a mountain belt of this magnitude. Continent-continent collision and subcontinent-continent collision, both in tandem forming this east-west mountain range. And then finally, towards the later part of the Paleogene in the Oligocene epoch. Now, North America is looking very modern, with a few exceptions, as is South America. The Atlantic Ocean is looking more like today's Atlantic Ocean, still connected with the Pacific. So a very narrow seaway there, but it's still connected. Off in the eastern hemisphere, we have continued collision of Africa with Eurasia, the Alps, 
are evolving, as are the Himalaya, full-blown continent continent collision now, and so it's one continuous mountain belt. Quite likely, the rival of the Allegheny Highlands, or even exceeding the Allegheny Highlands in size. So taking this back, just looking at a few things, notice the formation of the, the North Atlantic and the Arctic Ocean over time. And then also the development of this mountain belt here from Africa over to India. So specifically, let's watch India move its way north into collision with Eurasia here. Boom. Which continues today. Looking a little more closely at North America, here's the picture at the beginning of the Cenozoic, the beginning of the Paleogene. So the Rocky Mountains in full development on the West Coast. Gone is the interior seaway drained off to either the Arctic Ocean in the north or the Gulf of Mexico in the south. We can see the Gulf of Mexico there. Florida has not quite uh, come above sea level yet, but you can see shallow marine environment, shelf and reef system that make up the rocks that will form future Florida. Cuba and the Caribbean are taking shape too. The East Coast, you can see Greenland. So that's about 66 million. We move forward a few million years into the Paleocene, and the Rocky Mountains are maturing. A large portion of the craton is being deformed here by the Rocky Mountains, extending all the way up the coast. Alaska is finally starting to take shape. Subduction of the Farallon plate over here with North America. And then the Eocene, not much has changed there. Again, the Rocky Mountains are ending their development and starting to erode. You can still see the remnants of the Appalachians over here where they were cut off by rifting of Pangaea. And the end of the Paleogene and the Oligocene, again, continued erosion of the Rockies, at least in the United States portion, but a mountain belt we call the North American Cordillera, extending all the way from Central America and through Mexico, the Sierra Madre, the Rocky Mountains of the U.S., the Canadian Rockies, and then into Canada. So subduction zone developing here, the Caribbeans with a little island arc that remains there today. So let's back it up and look at the sequence. 66, 60, 40, 25. So one major change is the development of the North Atlantic Ocean up here, separating Greenland and the North American Craton from Eurasia. And this, of course, is the Arctic Ocean. In central North America, we have the Mississippi embayment, and this is a feature formed from the high stand of sea level, continuing from the Cretaceous into the Paleogene. So the warm climate, ice-free planet, high sea levels are giving shorelines that are inland of where the shorelines are today. So this diagram here shows where the shorelines have been at different times. So where they are at present is here in dark blue. Where it was at the end of the Cretaceous is this black line here. So that's kind of the high stand. So it's not the same shoreline as today. It's much higher sea level back then. If you look at this part of it where the Mississippi River is today, here's the course of the Mississippi. There was an embayment where the shoreline bowed to the north of Memphis, and this is called the Mississippi Embayment. You can see sea levels dropped over time through the Paleogene. They got lower, so the shoreline receded. 
and this marine regression would continue with fits and starts through the glaciations at the end of the era, but more or less there's a trend towards lower and lower sea levels and the shoreline moves seaward. And so here is the shoreline again today and here's where it was at the beginning of the Paleogene. So much higher sea levels and the Mississippi embayment is a reflection of that. This area right here, these are all Paleocene and Eocene deposits that are marine in origin. They got marine fossils and all sorts of stuff like that, and that continues all the way up the eastern seaboard. Okay, and then we see slightly younger Eocene deposits covering here, and so these are all reflective of the shallow continental shelf that flooded the um, North American craton here uh, at the beginning of the Paleogene and then receded with time. Well, in Western North America, we have the Rocky Mountains continuing to develop from around 80 million in the Cretaceous through the KT boundary into the Paleogene period. So mountains that extend all the way from the subduction zone in the West, okay, thousands of kilometers east towards central Colorado, where the front range is today. It's not a continuous sequence of mountains. There are different provinces in here, like the Colorado Plateau, which would develop eventually. But there are also basinal areas, low areas, where the mountains are draining and the streams aren't mature enough yet to connect with the ocean. So the water collects in these what are called intermontane basins. And there's a number of significant ones, like the Green River Basin in Wyoming, the Uinta Basin in Utah and northwestern Colorado. And so these are major mountain lakes that have a quite robust ecosystem associated with them, whether it's plant or animal. A lot of Eocene fish live in these lakes. In western North America, we see an extent of tectonic highlands that the craton is likely never seen. So the Rocky Mountains extending all the way from the coast inland, again with different parts, but fold and thrust belts in the south and north and broad basement uplifts in the central part, big plateau areas, mountain lakes, all from the flat subduction, low angle subduction of the Farallon Oceanic Plate underneath North America. As this ocean subduction margin evolves, you get a volcanic arc built on the continent. It's called a continental volcanic arc. With steep subduction, that arc forms closer to the subduction zone, but as the subduction angle flattens, the slab dip decreases, the arc starts to migrate inland. Okay, and so the maximum distance the continental arc got was somewhere in the West Texas area up through New Mexico and Colorado. Typical continental arc volcanism, just like we have today, very explosive stratovolcanoes, calderas, lava domes, rivers, streams, floodplains, lakes, all sorts of continental sedimentation. This was a time of very diverse tectonism, including robust compressional mountain building, as mentioned in the Himalayas, the Alps, Andes, and Rockies. Looking at a map of the Earth, this shows the mountain belts, the origin spread around the planet that we're developing at this time, from the Alps to the Himalaya, the Rockies, and the Andes. So major mountain belts forming at this time. Looking at these maps here, these mountain belts are in orange. Here's the Alps, Himalaya, origin. Uh, not shown are the Andes and the Rockies. Okay, because basically this is by late Eocene and there the Rocky Mountain development had pretty much tailed off by then. But this map does show the extent of the Laramide orogeny. And it's not just the Rocky Mountain in the U.S. kind of thing. Also, the continental arc extending down into Mexico, that's the Sierra Madre. 
the U.S. portion of the Rockies, and the Canadian Rockies. So this is all what's called the North American Cordillera. This extends into South America too in the Andes. These are big stratovolcanoes that are part of that continental volcanic arc in the Valley of the Dead. Very cool name there down in Chile. We also have rifting of the North Atlantic Ocean to talk about. The initial opening up of the North Atlantic, not just the Northern Atlantic, but the northernmost part, which will connect the, the North Atlantic proper with the Arctic Ocean. When that happens, we're going to see a flood basalt eruption get that kicked off. So a rifting event. And then hot spots are going to start showing up around the world. And they've been appearing from time to time throughout geologic history. But the emperor seamounts that are still around today and a few of the oldest Hawaiian islands are starting to form in the ocean basins. Well, we have a lot to talk about here. Let's start in southern Eurasia with the Himalayan orogeny. And this really began in the Eocene, continues till today. So maybe around 55 million. It's hard to pin down the precise time of when the first contact was. But this was the picture over time as India made its way north. Subduction of the Tethys Oceanic Plate continued. So this is where it was in the Cretaceous. This is where it was in the beginning of the Eocene. Somewhere in this time period right here is where it contacted Eurasia. So a continent-continent collision. This forms the Himalaya. This shows the cross-section and the evolution of the boundary. So here is that Tethys Plate subducting down underneath Eurasia. A continental arc here developing at the time. Here is a accretionary wedge as the Eurasian plate bulldozes its way over the Tethys subducting plate till finally they come into contact sometime in the Eocene. Notice the word ophiolite there. That's as the overlying plate scrapes off portions of the subducting plate. So there are portions of a subducting slab that are surviving in this accretionary wedge. And the collision continues as the plate continues to pull the rest of the plate with it. Subduction more or less shuts off. No more arc volcanism once this happens. And continued collision here between this continental plate and this one. The high Himalaya are fairly young. The rocks in it, though, are fairly old. They're early Paleozoic and even older. Um, but the mountain range is Cenozoic. And just looking at this picture here, which is a broad panoramic of the high Himalaya, shows the different rock types that are present. Many of them sedimentary, some of them metamorphic, some, some of them igneous. Here, of course, is looking at Everest from the south. That's not the north face. That's looking the south side. And you can wind your way up here through these valleys and eventually climb up. The main route is right up the side here. So that is one of the peaks. And a little farther west in the Himalaya is K2, which is the second highest peak in the world. That has also been climbed, and there are a number of different routes there to the top. Let's stay in southern Eurasia and move a little farther west, where we have the Alpine orogeny. And it began in the Paleocene and continues till this day, although activity has waned over time. And it is also a continent-continent collision between the African continental plate and the smaller Arabian plate with the Eurasian continental plate. So a continent-continent collision forming from Spain and West Africa all the way east into Persia, which is uh, Iran and connecting with the Himalaya off a little bit farther. The present day Pyrenees Mountains, the Alps themselves, and other mountain ranges are all parts of this mountain belt called the Alps. So continent-continent collision has abundant compressional structures like reverse faults, thrust faults, and folds of different kinds, like here at Dent de Morclis, okay, where you can see a fold that's just outstanding. And remember, when the axial plane is horizontal like that, we call it a recumbent fold. 
instead of the fold being upright like this where the plane is vertical, the plane is now horizontal because the fold is leaning over. It's recumbent. It's doing that because there are tectonic forces that are from a preferred direction that are causing it to lean over. Of course, here's the mother of all glacial horns, the Matterhorn. Well, let's move into the Western Hemisphere and South America. Talk about the Andes. And this mountain belt got its start in the Cretaceous, maybe around 90 million, similar to the Rocky Mountains, and continues until this day. And the reason why it continues is there's still oceanic plate that's subducting underneath continental plate. So the Nazca plate off to the west subducting underneath the continental South American plate, giving folding, thrusting, and magmatism and volcanism of a continental volcanic arc that are the Andes Mountains. So it's a tectonic and magmatic mountain range. The geology is fairly complex when you look at a geologic map. South America, there's all sorts of elements to it, and it stretches all the way from the southernmost part towards Central America. Some general features include the continental arc itself and these huge stratovolcanoes, a line of them. So that's the Andes Mountains themselves. Alpamayo is one example here. Imagine climbing that. Of course, there's Machu Picchu in the heart of the Andes as well. So this is a, an older mountain range. It's been forming since the Cretaceous and continues to the present. Ocean, continent, subduction. In Western North America, we have the Laramide orogeny. Just like the Andean orogeny, it continues from the Cretaceous, about 80 million or so, into the Eocene to maybe 40 or so at the youngest. It spans the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, and it's a ocean continent subduction related orogeny as well, but there's some key differences. The Farallon plate is the subducting plate that's going down underneath North America. This little symbol right here is the subduction zone. This is the mid-ocean ridge which is creating the Farallon plate. That's important because over time subduction of this Farallon plate is bringing that mid-ocean ridge closer and closer and closer. So the Pacific plate, so on the western side of that mid-ocean ridge, will ultimately be brought into contact with North America and we'll talk about what that means. But for now, it's just the Farallon plate going down, and this is forming the Rocky Mountains. At this point, we had mentioned that the slab angle was decreasing. During the beginning of the Eocene, the subduction angle was relatively flat, so flat subduction. The mid-ocean ridge is over here, very close to the subduction zone, so the plate was probably fairly warm and buoyant. A number of different factors contributed to why the subduction angle was flat. But when it's flat like that, it is in contact with the overlying plate along a broad area here, which would transmit stresses into that overlying plate. And that's what's producing the Rocky Mountain orogeny here, all the way into Colorado and West Texas before the plate would start to bend and dip into the mantle. So that would be the ultimate distance eastward of the Rocky Mountains. When we look at a map of how far they got, the central Colorado area, New Mexico, all the way down into Mexico itself. And there's different parts to the Rockies. There's the Southern Rockies here, which is mostly continental arc related and fold and thrust belts. So in the Sierra Madre of Mexico, lots of volcanics related to the continental arc. And in front of that, fold and thrust style tectonism, much like the severe orogeny of the Mesozoic. Farther north into New Mexico and Colorado, we have basement uplifts. So high angle reverse faults bringing up Precambrian basement blocks. Lots of monocline action in this area. And then farther north, continuation of the continental arc and the fold and thrust belt. And that is the Northern Rockies and Canadian Rockies. So this central area is a little bit different because the slab here is probably a little bit different in its geometry than farther south and farther north. So this is the whole Rocky Mountain Belt. We call it the 
North American Cordillera. And it's interesting to note the limit of the severe orogeny, which was the orogeny that just preceded the Laramide. The farthest east its deformation got was about here, more or less the Las Vegas up through Salt Lake City line. And so the slab dip angle there was a little bit steeper, and so it only affect, it affected a great area here, but not nearly as much as the Laramide. Once the slab would go flat, it would shut off magmatism in that continental arc in this whole area. So the only place we were seeing the arc form was where the slab would go through 100 kilometers. And it, since the slab dip was so shallow here, it wasn't getting to that depth until this far east. So we saw a migration of the continental arc from west to east until it ultimately got to about here before it would stop and then eventually turn around. So magmatism was slowly and progressively shut off in this area right here as the slab went flat. Well, let's look what happens to the subducting slab into the Oligocene. Its dip angle starts to increase again. The subduction angle of the Farallon plate begins to increase and this effectively ends the Laramide orogeny. And as it increases, the continental volcanic arc created from where that slab goes through 100 kilometers depth or so, starts to march back to the west. So as slab dip decreased and went horizontal, the continental arc marched from west to east, and now as the dip angle is increasing again, it's going back from east to west. So we can actually see this by mapping out the different plutonic rock bodies that represent the continental arc and their volcanic counterparts and looking at their ages and we can see the progression both ways. As the arc progressed back to the west, these magmas are passing through tectonically thickened crust. So it's very thick crust. It's being heated by all these magmas and we're seeing a lot of volcanic activity as a result. And this is called the mid-tertiary ignimbrite flare-up. So mid-tertiary, we're seeing the, that word again. So tertiary, so this is the end of the Paleogene, more or less, the mid-tertiary. Ignimbrite is a word that represents volcanism. It's very felsic in flavor. It's a lot of caldera-style volcanic eruptions, voluminous ash flow sheets, that kind of stuff. So ignimbrite is a volcanic term, and it represents the style of volcanism where you get a lot of caldera eruptions and ash flows and that kind of thing. So thick crust, high heat flow from the arc passing through that crust gives you this continental caldera style volcanism. So lots of different major felsic volcanic fields across the Rocky Mountain area. The Sierra Madre in Mexico is a thick sequence of these felsic volcanic units, a huge area of these. That extends northward into the U.S., the Mogollon de Teal field in eastern Arizona and western New Mexico. Moving into the Four Corners region in Colorado, we have the San Juan Mountains, which included some major league caldera eruptions in terms of volume. And then there's the Marysville area over in Utah, so, and then into the Great Basin of Nevada itself. All of these represent this mid-tertiary ignimbrite flare-up, which represents the heating of this tectonically thickened crust, and this is the result. We've been talking about subduction-related tectonics for quite a while now with regards to Western North America. Well, things are going to change in the late Oligocene. Subduction of this Farallon plate will continue in places, but the mid-ocean ridge that's creating the Farallon plate is starting to subduct at very localized places. So here's the picture in the late Oligocene where you have subduction along the entire length of the boundary there. And then here is the East Pacific rise with Pacific plate being generated on the west side and the Farallon on the east side. Here's a big transform fault, which is typical in mid-ocean ridge systems. 
sometime about 28 million years ago, we think, this mid-ocean ridge first contacted the subduction zone and started to be subducted underneath North America. Ever since then, from the late Oligocene all the way forward into the Miocene until today, that subduction has continued. And as you subduct the mid-ocean ridge, no more mid-ocean ridge forming here. So the Farallon plate keeps going down. However, the Pacific plate, since there's no mid-ocean ridge, doesn't form anymore. So the whole boundary changes here once you start to subduct the mid-ocean ridge. And what's being formed is the San Andreas Transform. Because the Pacific plate is moving to the left, as is the North American plate. And so even though they're not going in quite the same direction, there is an end to subduction and a creation of a transform boundary, which is lengthening progressively, getting longer and longer over time as more and more of this mid-ocean ridge gets subducted until what we have today. With the surviving Farallon plate being very far south in terms of the Rivera and Cocos plate in Central America, and then the Juan de Fuca plate farther north. So these are the remnants of Farallon. So this progressively ends the arc volcanism. As subduction shuts off, there's no more magmas rising to produce volcanoes in the overlying plate. So your continental arc ends, and we can see that very clearly in the geology. So the late Oligocene, we have the downgoing plate, magmas rising, continental arc. But once you start to subduct this mid-ocean ridge, this part of the plate goes down this way, the Farallon plate, and the plate that was on the west side, which is Pacific, it's not subducting anymore. And now you're forming this transform boundary where they're both going in the same direction, more or less, but one slightly different, and so it's transform. So what is going to start to appear is this window in the slab. It's called a slab window. That's where the mid-ocean ridge used to be. And as this plate keeps going down, down, down to the mantle, this window gets bigger and bigger and allows hot asthenosphere to come up from underneath. So the slab window will progressively get bigger. But for now, it's just simply the initial contact of this mid-ocean ridge with the subduction zone. And it's really changing the geology and the tectonics of Western North America in a big way. And so the new transform boundary we call the San Andreas. And back in the latest Paleogene, it's still rather small. Sometime around 28 million is when we think it first contacted. So by the time it got to the end of the Oligocene at about 23, it still wasn't very big. And by about 20, it might have been a little bit longer. So this is going to switch the tectonics from compressional, ocean continent compressional tectonics, to transform shear tectonics, where plates are sliding by each other, or even extensional tectonics, as this asthenosphere comes up and impacts the bottom of the North American continental plate, you're going to get uplift and extension. And simply put, you're going to get extension because there's no more compression. So it's just a relative thing. So it is a magmatic change and it's a tectonic change. Now for some geology. In the North Atlantic, we see the North Atlantic Igneous Province, or NAIP. This is a plume-related flood basalt event of the Paleocene into the earliest Eocene, but mostly Paleocene, 61 to 54. And this is the eruption of over 6 million cubic kilometers of flood basalt in a very short period of time, peaked around 60, 61 million. And this is related to the opening of the North Atlantic. Okay, so really it's the Iceland hotspot, and that's the beginning of the, the rifting process of the North American and Eurasian plate, bowing up of the continental lithosphere, rifting, eruption of flood basalts, eventual widening, and you get the ocean basin, which is now the North Atlantic. To begin that process is the rifting and the flood basalt related to the mantle plume here. And these different rocks 
representing this eruption are present on the western side of this ocean basin, the Greenland area, and also on the southeast side in the British Isles. And so whether it's in Greenland, these mafic lava flows flow after flow after flow, flood basalt, or places in Ireland and Scotland, Giants Causeway, very cool columnar jointing in these basalts. This is all related to the North Atlantic Igneous Province. Iceland today is built on the same mantle plume that created this NAIP 60 million years ago. So it's much like the Hawaiian hotspot, which created seamounts, which are tens of millions of years old, been around for a while. So has the Iceland hotspot. Flood basalt eruption, you know there's a good correlation between mass extinction events and big flood basalt eruptions, and this certainly is a big one. There's no correlation with a mass extinction, but it might have caused a change in the climate, something known as the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. Again, those gases probably added to the atmosphere changed the climate somewhat significantly, but life seemed to be able to adjust to it. Well, on the Pacific plate, we have the Emperor Seamounts forming, and they began in the late Cretaceous or so and continue through the Eocene, and they're formed as the Pacific Oceanic Plate passes over mantle plume. This is the Hawaiian mantle plume, and this map shows the layout of the Emperor Seamounts and Hawaiian Island chain. So the Aleutian Trench up here, the tail of Alaska, these are the oldest seamounts. The Suiko Seamount here is about 60 million years in age. And they get younger and younger as you go south down to Coco, which is about 48. And then they take a bend. There's an elbow here and there's a bend. And we see the first islands of the Hawaiian island chain midway. And then younger, younger, younger to the Hawaiian islands of Oahu and Maui and the Big Island where the hotspot is located right now. So here's the mantle plume right now, and that's where the hotspot is. It has created this whole line of volcanoes, some of which are underneath the ocean and some are sticking up above the ocean. So some are submarine and some are making up volcanic islands. The plume is fixed in the mantle. The plate over top of it is moving. And so that's what's creating this linear chain of volcanoes. So during emperor time in the Paleogene, the plume was here and the plate was moving north, northwest over it. At about 43 million, we see a change in the orientation of the seamounts. Okay? And that represents either that the plume had moved or the, the direction of plate movement changed. And we think that's been the common thought is that the plate movement changed because of various configurations around the boundary of the Pacific. It went from moving more northward to moving more westward. And that happened relatively suddenly at about 43 million. There's also some thought that the plume itself could move a little bit, but probably mostly the, the change in the overriding plate direction. In Western North America, we have the Green River Formation, which is Eocene in age, 54 to 48 or so. These deposits were forming in the lake basins of the Rocky Mountains, so intermontane lakes. The Utah, Colorado, Wyoming area included large lake deposits in the Uinta Basin, the Green River Basin, the Pisciance, the Washakie, and other smaller ones. This is what they look like. Typical lacustrine or lake sediments, fine-grained muds and sands, organic material. It's very abundant and there are coal seams and also oil shale that is abundant. This shows oil potential in some of these basins. So these are intermontane basins. There's no real external drainage. So the water the streams drain off the mountains and collects in these large lakes. Many of the deeper parts of these lakes have very poor circulation, so they're anoxic, and so you get these black shales, and if they are rich in organic material, 
that can develop into oil shale. So these are some major oil shale plays in the Rocky Mountain region. We see fossils of fish very common on bookshelves everywhere. You can see Eocene fish from the Green River Formation. There's also plants of various kinds, palm trees and broadleaf plants that are preserved in this deposit because it's a nice quiet water environment, very fine grain material, preserving these organisms very nicely. Rocks of the Claron Formation is deposited down here in southwestern Utah, and these are stream and lake sediments, fluvial and lacustrine sediments that were deposited in Lake Claron, which would form Bryce Canyon. Look at pictures of Bryce Canyon, very cool place to hike. These are lake sediments and stream sediments, but fine grain clastic sediments that were deposited in and around Lake Claron. And these aged sediments form what are called the Pink Cliffs, and they are part of what is known as the Grand Staircase. So in northern Arizona and southern Utah, the Grand Staircase, it's a series of cliffs that have various colors. The oldest ones are the Chocolate Cliffs of the Shinarump Conglomerate in the uh, bottom of the Chinui, then the Vermilion Cliffs, and White Cliffs, that's the Glen Canyon group, White Cliffs being the Navajo sandstone. And then we move into younger rocks that are Cretaceous, the Mesa Verde group. These are the Gray Cliffs. Gray, remember the Manca Shale and Tropic Shale. These are darker mudstones. And then the Pink Cliffs are the youngest ones. So these are Cenozoic Paleogene Lake Sediments, the Pink Cliffs. So there's the Grand Staircase. And the Pink Cliffs are simply the highest step on that staircase. Well, at the same time, we had a lake deposition in Utah and Wyoming and Colorado. In Arizona, we had the rim gravels, which represent stream deposits. So the situation at the time was southern Arizona was mountainous, and it was thick crust, and the location of these volcanic mountains, the volcanic arc was progressing back to the west. And so an area of highlands on this map here of Arizona, it shows where we think some of these highlands were, basically in southern and central Arizona. And as they weather and erode, material would flow down stream channels into lower areas. And there's two major accumulations of these rim gravel deposits, one to the northwest of Flagstaff near Peach Springs, Another one farther southeast in the Young Heber area. This is the present day Mugion Rim. And so these deposits got the name Rim Gravel. And this is a geologic map of Arizona. The yellow unit here are the Rim Gravels. This is what an outcrop of the Rim Gravels look like. The large, rounded, class, typical stream conglomerate. We try to figure out what the depositional environment was. Well, it's a stream. Well, where was the stream coming from? Where was it going? So when you look at the outcrops now, you can look at the composition of the class and try to figure out where the source areas were. It's called class provenance. And so people have done that. They've done a statistical count of all the different compositions here and try to match them with compositions of outcrops in the region. And as it turns out, when you look at these rocks here, they don't match the Paleozoic and Mesozoic sedimentary compositions that are locally close by, but they do match compositions we see farther south. So there's igneous and metamorphic rocks in abundance in the rim gravels, which are totally lacking in the high area of the Colorado Plateau today, but they are present in mountain ranges to the south. So we think the source area for these rim gravels was farther south in these tectonic and volcanic highlands, which are eroding and shedding streams to the north. So this was a little bit of a puzzle to figure out, and eventually it was, because the Mugion Rim today is high, and these rocks, these outcrops, are at seven, 8,000 feet or more in elevation, and farther south, where these rocks came from, is much lower, a few thousand feet of elevation. 
it begs the question of how did they get there and simply put the landscape of the Eocene must have been totally different than the landscape of today and between the Eocene and now there's a major reversal of elevations in the Eocene it was high in the south lower in the north and today it's just the opposite so sometime in between this changed but these rim gravels are one subtle but really important clue that that change happened sometime in the Cenozoic. Let's talk a little bit more about volcanism during this time and the felsic volcanic fields. The style of volcanism is known as ignimbrite volcanism because it's largely felsic in composition and very explosive, giving you a lot of volcanic ash. What's doing this again is the thick crust from the laramide orogeny. Add that with the higher heat flow from the magmatic arc returning, heating up that thick crust and giving you crustal melting and that's what generates felsic magmas. The style of eruptions are very explosive and these include calderic eruptions with lots of other secondary lava dome and lava flow eruptions as well, but mainly pyroclastic eruptions like this, where you can see an eruption column and ash fall coming from it, but also pyroclastic flows emanating from the eruption column itself. So this kind of volcanic eruption deposits volcanic ashes, various kinds, which eventually look like these rocks here in the Chiricahua Mountains of southeastern Arizona. This is a series of volcanic deposits in the Turkey Creek caldera that formed during the Paleogene. So I mentioned the various places across western North America that were huge centers of this ignimbrite volcanism, all the way from the Sierra Madre in Mexico, huge center of volcanic activity, farther north into the boot heel of New Mexico and Arizona, of which the Chiricahuas are part. The Mogollon de Teal field in eastern Arizona and western New Mexico. Moving farther north into Colorado is the San Juan volcanic field with some major eruptions there. And then in Utah, see the Marysville area. In Arizona itself, here's a geologic map showing the different ages of volcanic rocks over the past 200 million years. And so the ones of this age are in yellow. Here's the boot heel, the Chiricahuas, the Pinaleños, and Galieros, and here's the White Mountain volcanic field. And across the basin range, there are other isolated mountain ranges which have rocks which represent this ignimbrite volcanism whether it's the superstition mountains near phoenix farther west towards wickenburg farther west towards human the kofa and castle dome mountains the climate of the paleogene was warm for the most part when we look at the diagram here showing the climate trends over the Phanerozoic eon you can see the Cretaceous was relatively warm, approaching hothouse status, and then cooling towards the end. This spike here is possibly impact winter event from a KT impact. But then in the Eocene, a continued warm trend, and then a spike here, the Paleocene-Eocene boundary, and that's called the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. And so a drastic increase of the temperatures and then a subsequent equally drastic decrease. Back to the warm climate of the Eocene and then a progressive cooling trend towards the end of the Paleogene. So relatively warm for the Paleocene and Eocene. And by the end of the Eocene into the Oligocene, we see a cooling trend. Fairly significant drop off here of the temperatures, and we'll see a return of the ice. It's about 34 million, the beginning of the Oligocene, is a different climate. So warm during the Paleocene, Eocene, and then cooling towards the Oligocene. When we look at the ice distribution on the planet over the last 
800 million years. Remember the Snowball Earth events where at least a couple times the Earth was entirely covered by ice from the equator to the poles. One final event in the Neoproterozoic. Times of ice ages at the end of the Ordovician with an extinction event related. A couple other ones end of the Devonian with an extinction event. We see the Gondwana glaciations. Possibly during the Mesozoic, some ice buildup in Antarctica. But nothing in between. Throughout much of the Cretaceous into the Paleogene, the Earth we think was ice-free until now. And now we see in Antarctica and the North Atlantic buildup of ice, and that's going to remain. And so we are now entering an ice age by the end of the Eocene into the Oligocene. And so that's pretty much what this trend is showing us to where we are today. The Paleogene climate was warm until it wasn't. In the late Eocene, there would be a rapid cooling trend as well as a drying trend, and ice caps would start to form in Antarctica. And this would be the first time we'd see ice there in quite some time. What allows us to say this is looking at plant fossils and also deep sea cores. Plant leaves have different margins, which can be correlated to the temperatures in which they grow. This is what's called an entire margin leaf, a very smooth outline there. These grow in warmer temperatures versus jagged margin leaves grow in cooler temperatures. And there's a very nice correlation there between the type of leaf margin and the temperature. So the percent of entire margin species, as we get more and more of the smooth margin, entire margin leaf, those represent warmer climates. So when we look at the plant fossils across the Cenozoic, from the Paleocene to Eocene, Oligocene, and then Younger, we can plot the percentage of entire margin leaves with time. And you can see in the Paleogene, more than half of the leaves that we find are this entire margin, warmer climate type of leaf. And there's some ups and downs throughout the Paleogene, but really right at the end of the Eocene into the beginning of the Oligocene, there's a significant drop-off so that there's only 30 or 40 percent or less that are entire margin. And so this right here, this change from the different type of plant margin this is showing us there's a change in the climate from warmer to colder. And what's causing this, we think, is plate tectonics, specifically at the South Pole, where Antarctica has been positioned for some time at the South Pole, but it still hasn't had a whole lot of ice. And that's probably because the ocean currents were such that it would moderate the climate there. And so really we've had forests and cooler climate, but not an ice cap. Well, that would change by the early Oligocene with the rifting away of Australia and separation of Antarctica and South America would allow a circumpolar current to develop, which would isolate the Antarctic plate and allow ice to build up. So it's simply the plate tectonics changing oceanic circulation patterns, which change the climate around Antarctica, which is going to end up changing the climate globally in the long run. So again, the slow mundane process of plate tectonics over time has a huge effect. Life of the Paleogene, quite different than where we left off in the Cretaceous. Dominantly mammal life. So it's interesting when we look at the beginnings of vertebrates in our family tree, all the way back to the Cambrian and Pacaya and its evolution through the various kinds of fish, eventually to amphibians and reptiles and sooner or later a certain kind of reptile known as a synapsid. And those synapsids then would transform eventually into different kinds of mammalia forms and then mammals and eventually by the Cenozoic into a whole suite of all sorts of different kinds of mammals, which is shown here in more detail. We've seen mammals into the Mesozoic 
they get their origin there. Many of them would die off and they remain small. But really, it was in the Paleocene where we see the rapid diversification of all these different forms. While some continued on from the Mesozoic, most mammals got their origins in the Paleocene, where we see the most. And there's all different kinds of mammals, but they would get their start in the Paleocene. Some would only last for an epoch or two into the Eocene and then die off, but many of them would flourish and become even more abundant with time. Let's start with land mammals, the Paleocene and Eocene. They're still relatively small, true of the Cretaceous varieties as well. Early primates, bats, dogs, and cats, creatures like that. But the early versions of the primates and the Paleocene remain few and relatively small. A few radiations through the Eocene, including Darwinius here, which is an early primate form, but it's really later where we'd see the diversification into all the different types, which we'll talk about later. We also see ungulates. That's a strange word that just means any animal with a hoof. Okay, A hooved animal is an ungulate. And of the ungulates, you can have ones with an odd number of toes. Okay, And these include the horses and rhinoceros family, etc. And here is a picture of an odd-toed ungulate. This is Eohippus, which lived during the Eocene, of course. And Eohippus is shown here, very small, almost like a small dog in size. So imagine that, a horse that's that size. And they would grow into larger forms with time. By the end of the Paleogene, we'd have Mesohippus, a little bit larger, but nothing like Secretariat at the end. More like what Frank Zappa would call a pygmy pony. Okay, so there's odd-toed ungulates like horses, but also even-toed ungulates. And this would include other mammals like cows, sheep, and pigs. The Oligocene epoch would be a little bit different than the preceding two, in terms that the mammals would grow to huge sizes, like this hornless rhino family member. This is Indricotherium, which was maybe six meters tall at the shoulders. So quite possibly the largest land mammal of all time. There are also smaller mammals like monkeys and ape-like primates, including ones like this old world monkey. There's more advanced cats and dogs, but also ungulates are evolving into scary carnivorous forms like Entelodon, also known as a hell pig. Just as scary as anything the Mesozoic could put out, the Cenozoic had its share of scary land critters too. Certainly, Entelodont was one. Well, life in the oceans included marine mammals. And really, during the Paleocene and Eocene, the main story is about the evolution of whales, or cetaceans. So, this story is kind of reverse from what we're used to, where marine organisms evolve into more of a terrestrial organism much like the lobe fin fish transitioned into amphibians. With whales, they got their start as bear-like land animals, like a very primitive bear-like creature. And we think that those evolved over time into more aquatic forms. And then we see a bunch of intermediate forms representing the evolution of whales into what we see today. So this occurred in the Paleocene and early Eocene, very rapid evolution and diversification of these different forms. And the first sign of change was Pachycetus, found in Pakistan. And this is a, a land mammal that had some whale-like bone structure. But then a little bit later, we would have Ambulocetus. Ambulocetus, ambulo to walk, cetus meaning whale. This is the walking whale. And here you can see a similar form, developed webbed hands, more adapted to an aquatic environment. Two whale forms, Pachycetus and Ambulocetus, they represent the terrestrial to aquatic transition. 
and from Ambulocetus, we would get true whale-like forms after that into the later Eocene, and this is Bacillosaurus. This had its origins from a terrestrial mammal, and that's much more like a whale of today. Possibly 18 meters long, with its Mosasaur-like front end there, but its whale-like tail. This is a true marine mammal. So we see this evolution very quickly, the beginning of the Paleogene, from the Paleocene through the Eocene, this radiation of different, more advanced forms from more terrestrial to more aquatic and marine eventually. The evolution of the marine mammals in the Oligocene would see the whales or cetaceans split into two major groups, and this would occur by about 30 million years ago. Cetacea is called an infraorder, and it's split into two smaller orders, and this would include Mysticeti and Odontoceti. Mysticeti are various kinds of whales that are filter feeders, like baleen whales or blue whales or humpbacks. They are large and will swim and filter food as they swim, whereas Odontoceti are the toothed whales, and this includes dolphins and orcas and sperm whales. So we would see this branching out of cetaceans sometime in the Oligocene into more toothed whale odontoceti like dolphins and orcas versus the mysticeti and the blue whales and humpbacks. So on this diagram, you can see the different orders here, the mysticeti and the odontoceti, and they would split off sometime in the Oligocene here. Well, you know what time it is at the end of the lecture. Time to talk about plants and land plants, of course. Uh, the warm climate of the Paleogene was really conducive for all sorts of vegetative types, much like the most of the Mesozoic was. What we would see that's different, though, is the appearance and eventual rapid spread of grasses, Poaceae. And there's thousands of different types of grasses that are low green non-woody plants and there are structures such that there's a, a rhizome and there's different nodes along the rhizome and they develop leaf blades of various kinds and so very quickly grass would begin to proliferate and soon cover the planet but before the end of the paleogene there was no grass so any reconstruction of any ancient environment could not have any grass in it now for the first time we can start seeing grass. These would appear and start to expand pretty rapidly in the Oligocene, and this is because the climate changed. These could tolerate the cooler, drier environments, whereas more tropical vegetation struggled. So grasses really embrace the climate change. The cooling climate through the latter part of the Eocene would produce a few effects on life, not in terms of a mass extinction, but pulsed extinctions. And there were several of these that occurred over a span of about 10 million years from the Eocene into the Oligocene, from about 40 to about 30 million years. And for the most part, this is due to the plate tectonic induced cooling effect of the isolation of Antarctica. The development of the circumpolar current during the early Oligocene allowed the ice to build up and changed first locally, then regionally, then globally, the change in climate. If we look at climate over the Cenozoic era on this graph, it shows the what we think the global surface temperature was relative to today. So here is today. It shows that Earth was relatively ice-free throughout the Paleogene through the Paleocene and Eocene, but then things changed in the Oligocene. So it's relatively warm, 10 degrees warmer than today, 10 degrees C warmer than today, significantly warmer at the beginning of the Cenozoic. So following the KT mass extinction, fairly warm, and it would get even warmer. This is the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. And then from there, things would cool off and 
a cooling trend all the way into the Oligocene. And then right here is where there's a precipitous drop within this larger decrease. We think this is the inception of that circumpolar current around Antarctica. So the beginning of ice build up in Antarctica, the Antarctic glaciation would begin in the Oligocene, maybe about 34 million. And the climate has stayed cool since then, still warmer than today with a few warmer spikes. But then here in the Miocene, things would start to decline once again. And then in the last few million years, a significant drop off. This is the ice age we're living in now. But it all got its start really right here, which was the isolation of Antarctica via plate tectonics.